Chapter 28 Ahab For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches and for aught that could be seen to the contrary they seemed to be the only commanders. Of the ship only they sometimes issued from the cabin with orders so sudden and peremptory that after all it was plain they but commanded vicariously. Yes, their supreme lord and dictator was there, though hitherto unseen by any eyes not permitted to penetrate into the now sacred retreat of the cabin. Every time I ascended to the deck from my watches below, I instantly gazed aft to mark if any strange face were visible, for my first vague disquietude touching the unknown captain, now in the seclusion of the sea, became almost a perturbation. This was strangely heightened at times by the ragged Elijah's diabolical incoherences uninvitedly recurring to me, with a subtle energy I could not have before conceived of. But poorly could I withstand them, much as in other moods I was almost ready to smile at the solemn whimsicalities of that outlandish prophet of the wharves. But whatever it was of apprehensiveness or uneasiness to call it so which I felt, yet whenever I came to look about me in the ship, it seemed against all warranty to cherish such emotions. For though the harpooners with the great body of the crew were a far more barbaric, heenish, and motley set than any of the tame merchant ship companies which my previous experiences had made me acquainted with, still I ascribed this and rightly ascribed it to the fierce uniqueness of the very nature of that wild Scandinavian vocation in which I had so abandonedly embarked. But it was especially the aspect of the three chief officers of the ship the mates, which was most forcibly calculated to allay these colorless misgivings, and induce confidence and cheerfulness in every presentment of the voyage. Three better, more likely sea officers and men, each in his own different way, could not readily be found, and they were every one of them Americans, an Antucketer, a Vineyarder, a Cape Man. Now it being Christmas when the ship shot from at her harbor. For a space we had biting polar weather though all the time running away from it to the southward and by every degree and minute of latitude which we sailed gradually leaving that merciless winter and all its intolerable weather behind us it was one of those less lowering but still grey and gloomy enough mornings of the transition when with a fair wind the ship was rushing through the water with a vindictive sort of leaping and melancholy rapidity that as I mounted to the deck at the call of the forenoon watch so soon as I leveled my glance towards the taffrail foreboding shivers ran over me reality outran apprehension, Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter deck. There seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him, nor of the recovery from many. He looked like a man cut away from the stake, when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them, or taking away one particle from their compacted age robustness. His whole high, broad form, seemed made of solid bronze, and shaped in an unalterable mold, like Cellini's cast Perseus. Threading its way out from among his gray hairs, and continuing right down one side of his tawny scorched face and neck, till it disappeared in his clothing, you saw a slender rod-like mark, lividly whitish. It resembled that perpendicular seam sometimes. Made in the straight lofty trunk of a great tree when the upper lightning tearingly darts down it and without wrenching a single twig peels and grooves out the bark from top to bottom ere running off into the soil leaving the tree still. Greenly alive but branded whether that mark was born with him, or whether it was the scar left by some desperate wound, no one could certainly say. By some tacit consent, throughout the voyage little or no allusion was made to it, especially by the mates. But once Tashko S. Sr. an old gay head Indian among the crew superstitiously asserted that not till he was full forty years old did Ahab become that way branded and then it came upon him not in the fury of any mortal fray but in an elemental strife at sea. Yet, this wild hint seemed inferentially negatived, by what a grey manxman insinuated, an old sepulchral man, who, having never before sailed out of Nantucket, had never ere this lay die upon wild Ahab. Nevertheless, the old sea traditions, the immemorial credulities, popularly invested this old manxman with preternatural powers of discernment. So that no white sailor seriously contradicted him when he said that if ever Captain Ahab should be tranquilly laid out to which might hardly come to pass so he muttered then whoever should do that last office for the dead would find a birthmark on him from crown to soul. So powerfully did the whole grim aspect of Ahab affect me and the livid brand which streaked it, 
that for the first few moments I hardly noted that not a little of this overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood. It had previously come to me that this ivory leg had its sea been fashioned from the polished bone of the sperm whale's jaw. I, he was dismasted off Japan, said the old gay head Indian once, but like his dismasted craft, he shipped another mast without coming home for it. He has a quiver of him. I was struck with the singular posture he maintained. Upon each side of the Pequot's quarter deck, and pretty close to the mizzen shrouds, there was an auger hole, bored about half an inch or so, into the plank. His bone leg steadied in that hole, one arm elevated, and holding by a shroud, Captain Ahab stood erect, looking straight out beyond the ship's ever pitching brow. There was an infinity of firmest fortitude, a determinate, unsurrenderable willfulness, in the fixed and fearless, forward dedication of that glance. Not a word he spoke, nor did his officers say aught to him, though by all their minutest gestures and expressions, they plainly showed the uneasy, if not painful, consciousness of being under a troubled master rye. And not only that, but moody stricken Ahab stood before them with a crucifixion in his face, in all the nameless regal overbearing dignity of some mighty woe. Ere long, from his first visit in the air, he withdrew into his cabin. But after that morning, he was every day visible to the crew, either standing in his pivot hole, or seated upon an ivory stool he had, or heavily walking the deck. As the sky grew less gloomy, indeed, began to grow a little genial, he became still less and less a recluse, as if, when the ship had sailed from home, nothing but the dead wintry bleakness of the sea had then kept him so secluded. And, by and by, it came to pass, that he was almost continually in the air, but, as yet, for all that he said, or perceptibly did, on the at last sunny deck, he seemed as unnecessary there as another mast. But the Pequod was only making a passage now. Not regularly cruising nearly all whaling preparatives needing supervision the mates were fully competent to so that there was little or nothing out of himself to employ or excite Ahab now and thus chase away for that one interval the clouds that layer upon layer were piled upon his brow as ever all clouds choose the loftiest peaks to pile themselves upon. Nevertheless, ere long, the warm, warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant, holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to charm him from his mood. For as when the red-cheeked dancing girls April and May trip home to the wintry misanthropic woods even the barest ruggedest most thundercloven old oak will at least send forth some few green sprouts to welcome such glad-hearted visitants so Ahab did in the end a little respond to the playful allurings of that girlish air. More than once did he put forth the faint blossom of a look, which, in any other man, would have soon flowered out in a smile. 